Okay, this will be lesson number two on the gap. Last time, we really focused in on Lucifer's fall. Now we're going to really look at Genesis 1-1 through 1-2. And I'm going to show you why I believe that the Bible proves that something took place there. In Genesis 1-2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So first off, where it says the earth was without form and void. So that shows some type of catastrophe had taken place after the fact that God had created the heaven and the earth. And most likely right after Lucifer and the angels rebelled. So the Lord brought a universal flood that dropped the earth from the top of the universe, as we talked about. We talked about last time how the earth was at the top of the universe. And nothing was separating God from his creation. But then Lucifer, the angels rebelled with him. Now the earth is dropped from the top of the universe and God is separated from his creation. Now the north, where God dwells, had something beneath it. It's got something beneath it now. That's quarantining him from his. That's quarantining his creation from him, and the deep waters from the flood are causing a darkness. And on the top of it, it's like a frozen piece of ice. And the book of Job talks about it. It says in Job thirty-eight thirty, the waters. That would be those deep waters that came from this flood. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So you got this huge body of water that came from this catastrophe. And it's making darkness, and it's uh, separating God from his creation, and the top of it is frozen. Seems far-fetched? Yeah, because you've never heard it before. You're never going to hear this talk. People are going to think you're crazy. But remember... Remember that the, what's the Lord's throne sitting on, on top? What's the Lord's sitting? <coughs> what's the Lord's throne sitting on top of? It's sitting on top of a frozen sea of glass, right? Revelation four six fifteen two. Now everybody knows that. Everybody knows that there's a sea of glass up there, a sea of transparent glass. And the light reflecting on that glass is going to make it look like streets of gold, or street of gold. Also remember the Bible speaks of three heavens. You know, you know that right. I'll go ahead and explain it. You got the first heaven, which is our atmosphere, where the birds fly. You got the second heaven, where the sun and the moon and the stars are. And then you got the third heaven, where God is, up there in the north so you got three heavens right remember that more than one heaven then you look at psalm 148 and verse 4 it says praise him ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens notice it said waters above the heavens it didn't say waters above heaven it said heavens in the plural so that would mean there's a, a body of water above the first heaven, our atmosphere, and the second heaven where the sun, moon, and stars are. So there's a body of water up there. And on top of it is a frozen piece of ice, a sea of glass. Now this body of water is referred to as the deep. And it's also referred to as the sea. And when the Lord makes a new heaven and a new earth, there will, it says there, there's going to be no more sea. In Revelation 21, 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So no longer, at that time, there will be no longer, there will there be something separating God from his creation. And it's just going to be lit up by the Lord. There's going to be no need of the sun, right? And so that place, that 
body of water is referred to as the deep. And there's something in that right now, in that deep, that sea. It says in Isaiah 27, 1, In that day the Lord, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. It also says Leviathan is in those deeps in Job 41. Job 41 is like the greatest chapter on the devil in the Old Testament. And it's, it's, he's uh, calling him Leviathan. Now, Leviathan most likely was a literal water creature at one point. But it's also the devil because it calls him the it calls him king over all the children of pride and it it talks about in job 41 how he makes the deep to boil like a pot in job 41 31 it says he maketh the deep to boil like a pot he maketh the sea like a pot of ointment so you see that the deeps and the sea that's what's up above your head. That is where Satan abides in his natural state as a great red dragon. Now, he's walking to and fro. He's a, he's a spirit being. But in his natural state, he's up there in those deeps as a great red dragon. And it sounds crazy because you never heard it before. But you see in Revelation 21, 1, it says, And I, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. So that body of water up there that's creating that darkness, putting a separation between God and his creation, that's going to be gone. God's going to light up the place. And the Bible is like a circle. And in Revelation 21, the Lord puts it back like it originally was. And this time it's going to stay that way. So when he makes the new heaven and the new earth, there's no more sea and it has no need of the sun. Just like it would have been back in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth. When he created the heaven and the earth in Genesis 1-1, there was no need of the sun. It wasn't without form and void. Darkness wasn't upon the face of the deep. Those things only were there after the catastrophe had taken place. It had form, it wasn't void, it was no darkness because God's presence was there lighting up the place, making a complete absence of darkness. <coughs> so Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And by reading other parts of the Bible, I believe it's safe Bible doctrine and makes sense to insert an unknown period of time where Lucifer was perfect in beauty and without iniquity. And here you insert his fall and the angel's rebellion as well. And it's not some new teaching I've come up with. I'm not, I don't, I don't know that I've ever came up with some type of new teaching or anything like that. This is something that you can, if you, you, you can find this being taught all the way back to the apostles and, uh, the greatest, Bible teachers, whether you're not, you like Bible teachers, and you know, there's a lot of people that don't. They, they think that only the Holy Ghost can teach them, which that's true, but the Holy Ghost uses men to teach you. Some of the greatest teachers that's kept people with right doctrine over hundreds of years believed in the gap. Men like C. I. Schofield, Clarence Larkin, Peter S. Ruckman, I mean, the Arthur Pink. And I know Arthur Pink's got some bad stuff, but still, he's got some good stuff too. And all, all those guys, a lot of them, back in the 50s and 60s, you'd have, it'd have been hard to find somebody, a Bible-believing, premillennial, dispensational, that did not believe in the gap. Even right now, very, very few of the Bible-believing crowd today does... Uh, or anti-gap, very few. So it's not some wild, off-the-wall teaching other than in just the, the new average church. Before, it was common. 
to believe in the gap. So it's like you, well, a lot of the thing that keeps people from believing this is they think they're going to be seen as as weird and people's going to look at them funny. But it's not anything weird that's going on here. Really, there's not. It's that there was a period of time that's just not wrote about in between those two verses, and that was when Lucifer fell. That was when some angels rebelled, and God brought a flood that flooded out the original creation. And then the rest of Genesis 1 goes over the refashioning. So, Genesis 1-2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The deep is the waters that were used to flood out the original creation. But that phrase, without form and void, by searching the words and phrases, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and letting God interpret the words and phrases, you come to a conclusion that a catastrophe has taken place. Now, obviously, um, I don't know if you've heard of the law of first mention. Many times you can use that to define a word or phrase. But Genesis 1-2 is at the beginning of the Bible, so this is the first mention, and that's what's in question, so we got to go to the next mention, and, <clears throat> and that is in Jeremiah 4.23, and this, this seals the deal for me. I don't know why it doesn't seal the deal for other people, but if you go to Jeremiah 4.23, it has the same exact phrase, without form and void, and it says the phrase, they had no light. So in Jeremiah 4.23 it says, I beheld the earth, and lo it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Now obviously, I don't think that this is referring back to the event of Genesis 1.1, but it's referring to a future time of destruction where God, in, in His divine judgment, makes the earth without form and void. And that, that puts that phrase, without form and void, it associates it with a destructive act from God Himself. So that, that just, that, well, that, that, to me, that's God defining the, the phrase for us. And I believe that's the proper way to define words and phrases in the Bible. Not going to, and like people's going to say, you know, you believe the gap, so you're just following all these Bible teachers. No, because, just just because I, I believe like those Bible teachers said, they also went along with the Bible's interpretation of these words and phrases. You see, all I did was search that without form and void. It took me here, and it defines the words for me. But notice how this without form and void, how it's associated with a time of destruction, judgment from God. And you're going to see, obviously, something bad had taken place, will take place on the earth, making it like this. It says in the next verse, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. And I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. <coughs> And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Notice that. It's the Lord, Lord's judgment that made it without form and void. For thus said the Lord. For, the, for thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens be black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent Neither will I turn back from it. So while this is most likely not referring back to Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, that time when it was out without form and void, but still it sets the definition for that phrase, without form and void. And I think to overlook that is really being dishonest in your Bible study. If you overlook that, what do you do with that? I have to do something with it. 
So you can see from those verses that the phrase, without form and void, it's associated with the time of destruction. Even if Jeremiah 4 isn't referring back to Genesis 1-1. Honest Bible study, comparing scripture with scripture, defines words and phrases. Since, since Genesis 1-2 was the first mention of it, and that's what was in question, we go to the next mention, Jeremiah 4. And that, that defines it for us. By searching the phrase, you, you got the Lord's definition. We didn't have to go to somebody else. So the word void itself is very negative in the Bible. It uses the phrase void of understanding five times in the book of Proverbs, which just happens to be the number of death in the Bible. And that's exactly what Lucifer was void of, understanding. It says in Ezekiel 28.3, Lucifer is... That Lucifer is wiser than Daniel. Ezekiel 28 said he was full of wisdom. But why did he sin? Well, that's easy. It also said he corrupted his wisdom. And he was, void, he was obviously void of understanding. Because in uh, Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So Satan had the facts. He knew God in a very up close and personal way at being the anointed cherub that covereth. So he had knowledge of his power, his holiness, his, his, his beauty, his magnificence. And he saw him lay the foundations of the earth. He saw how he was supposed to worship the true God. He saw God on the throne. And he had just... A, uh, a multitude of wisdom himself, so therefore he would have known how to use the knowledge that he had, yet he was void, he became void of understanding most likely. But because over time, that that in his heart lifted him up in pride and he chose evil. That is just like many Bible believers, we have the facts. We know how to use the facts, yet we still choose evil. But when you look at the word void in the Bible, in Numbers 30, you find out that a husband could void a vow his wife had made, meaning he could cancel it out. And, you know, that's what the Lord had to do with the original earth. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. So the Lord spoke the heaven and earth into existence, and it was, it was perfect, ready to be inhabited. After the sin of Lucifer and the catastrophe that came as a judgment on his sin, it made the earth without form and void. He made deep, dark waters separate God from his creation. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. So we've seen that. It's without form and void now. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So see that? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's another sign that something bad went on. Why was darkness on the face of the deep if some type of sin and catastrophe had not taken place? For example, when the Lord makes a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem comes down, in Revelation 21, 23, it talks about the city having no need of the sun, right? Because the glory of the Lord is going to light the place up. Being in the presence of God is light. So in Genesis 1, 2, wouldn't there be no darkness at all if a sin hasn't taken place? And the Lord's light would, would make a complete absence of darkness. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So you could also sit and name off the verses where darkness is used in a negative light. In John 3, 19, it says, And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. <clears throat> the Bible 
divides darkness and light. Darkness is, it considers the evil, the forces of darkness. If you're on the right side, then you're light. It makes a distinction throughout the Bible. And if darkness is the absence of light, then why is there darkness in verse 2 when God is right there, present? Where did the darkness come from? Isaiah 45, 7 shows God forms the light and creates darkness. So why did he create it and how? Well, it seems he created it with a catastrophe. And something significant, you know, people talk about, you know, you just, you just come up with this gap thing back in the 1800s or somebody come up with it back in the 1800s goes back way before that um way before that and it even to me looks like paul the apostle paul himself was a gapper in um second corinthians 4 6 paul uses genesis 1 as an illustration of what took place inside of you at your salvation he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that was in Genesis 1, 2 through 3. Remember? He commanded the light to shine out of darkness in Genesis 1, 2 through 3. And the darkness in you as a lost man is compared here in 2 Corinthians to the darkness in Genesis 1-2. This looks like Paul was a gapper. And Paul was the greatest Bible student you ever saw. So let me show you the illustration he's referring to in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1 what says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Perfect creation, right? Just as Adam himself was made sinless, right? There was no sin in Adam at first. Genesis 1-2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So just like Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the world through Adam, passed down to you, and before you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were without form and void on the inside. You were full of darkness but then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You got saved, and on the inside, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God delivered you from the power of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of His dear Son, who is light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Just as God commanded the light to shine out of darkness in Genesis 1-3, He commands the light to shine in the center. So 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul's illustration doesn't make as much sense or hit anywhere near as hard if there isn't evil in Genesis 1, 2, just as there is evil in you before you got the light of the world in you. Just as the darkness in you was bad before you were saved and God got you away from the kingdom of darkness. You're no longer uh, a, a child of the devil. Now you're a child of God. Just as God made the light to shine in you, get rid of that darkness in you, He used the light to get rid of that darkness in Genesis 1-2, which most likely came about because of something evil. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, to further show that darkness isn't good in the scriptures, I'm going to name off some. Now, here's seven negative things associated with darkness. Number one, outer darkness. Matthew 8, 12. That's where somebody's going. Outer darkness. Two, works of darkness. Romans 13, 12. Three, Rulers of the darkness of this world. That's Ephesians 6.12. The fourth one, power of darkness. Colossians 1.13. Five, chains of darkness. 2 Peter 
Number six, mist of darkness. 2 Peter 2, 17. Seven, blackness of darkness forever. Jude, verse 13. And most of those are associated with eternal damnation or those who are going to eternal damnation. Darkness is associated with judgment. It's associated with the opposite of light. It's associated with evil. It's associated with the devil's team. I mean, going back to Job 38 can shed even more light on this event in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. It's like a commentary on Genesis 1, 1 through 2. <clears throat> Job 38, 4 through 6. Going back to when God was creating the earth and the sons of God were there. It says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? So now some guys will tell you this is referring to Jesus Christ, who obviously is the chief cornerstone, no doubt about that. However, the context shows what this is about. It isn't about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. It's actually about God creating the earth. And what happened during this time? Well, it says in verse 7, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the angelic beings were present in the beginning. The sons of God can't be people because... They weren't present when God was making this. So the angelic beings were present in the beginning before there's the, the six literal days of creation. But now look at verse 8. Something else happens here. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? You see that? Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth? This most likely refers to the flood that took place when Lucifer rebelled and only God could shut the doors on that. And who could create strong enough doors? Only God. In Job 38, 9, it says, When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. So the waters created a thick darkness that acted as a swaddling band, like grave clothes for the creation. <coughs> he wrapped it up like a mummy, with the darkness. So what do you see in Genesis 1-2? You see darkness. God has now separated himself from his creation. Job 38-10, And break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors. So he put up bars and doors to keep someone out. Well, why does God put up bars and doors to keep someone out? I guess the same reason he puts angels in everlasting chains under darkness. Does he necessarily need those things? No, he could just say it and they wouldn't be able to get in. He could just put those angels chained down there in darkness just with nothing. He, I mean, just he could say, stay, and they would stay. But God does things like this. In Job 38, 11, it says, And said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Notice that proud waves. What was Lucifer's sin? He was proud. Compare this with Jude, <coughs> verse 13, where he calls certain evil ones raging waves of the sea. Jude, Jude verse 12, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Notice that raging waves of the sea, and then Job 38, 11, it calls somebody proud waves. It calls somebody... Raging waves of the sea, and then Job 30, 11 talks about proud waves. Talks about wandering stars in Jude 13. Wandering stars. What do the angels refer to in Revelation 1, 20? Stars. It says it's reserved for them the blackness of what? Darkness. So you see, the Bible interprets itself. you got to search the scriptures. 
So Job 30, 11, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Well, he set up bars and doors, right? Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So, Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you got an earth without form and void, filled with darkness, covered in waters. That doesn't look like a constructive act. That looks like a, destruct, a time of destruction has taken place. Those who teach against the gap will teach that the Lord just started it out without form and void, with darkness and, and covered in water. And that he just formed it from that like you would Plato. But by saying this, they unknowingly teach more close to evolution than those who believe in a gap ever did. And I don't believe that anti-gappers support evolution by any means. I don't, I don't believe that. But I'm just saying that because they throw the accusation, the false accusation at us that we're trying to accommodate for evolution. But we're not. We don't believe in evolution. We don't believe God used evolution. I don't believe they believe that either. I'm just saying that because they throw in that accusation at us when their teaching actually is more like evolution than ours. But they teach more close to it than I am. All the while they teach we believe in theistic evolution. They think we believe there are billions of years between the first two verses of the Bible. They think we are trying to accommodate science, falsely so-called. But that's not what Bible believers teach about the gap at all. We just believe there was a time... In between the first two verses of the Bible, when Lucifer was on the throne, a time when he rebelled, and that time best fits between those two verses in your Bible. And when the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that's a perfect creation. The Lord spoke it, and it was there. It wasn't a process. There was no evolution. And then those waters covering the earth definitely hit, hint that an act of judgment had taken place. Covering waters... Are a sign of judgment. <coughs> Waters were covering the earth. And that's a sign of judgment. In Jonah 2 3, consider Jonah. It says, For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods can pass me about. Jonah, that's a. What, what, why, why did that happen to Jonah? Because he was running from God. The floods come past him about. Consider Noah's flood. Why was the, why was the earth covered with water then? Genesis six seventeen. And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Why did he do that? Because the thoughts and imaginations of man's heart was only evil continually. So covering waters is a judgment. Consider also how Satan, the chief counterfeiter, likes to copy the Lord's judgments. So what does he do in Revelation 12, 15? <coughs> <coughs> and the serpent cast out of his mouth waters as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So you see, he likes to copy everything the Lord does. And that's what the Lord does. He floods things out. The first two verses definitely point to a catastrophe in your Bible. Take into consideration that God gave Adam dominion over everything as well when he created him. And if Satan and Adam fell on the same day, like a lot of people teach that, well, Satan fell on the day that he tempted Eve. But if Satan, <clears throat> if Satan and Adam fell on the same day, how would you have both Satan with a throne as the top dog and Adam having dominion at the same time? Well, you see, it says in Genesis 128, Adam's given dominion. So how could he and Satan have both have it at the same time? What happened is Satan lost the throne and the crowns of the kingdoms went to Adam. Lucifer gets jealous and tempts him to sin. Also consider how Adam was said to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In Genesis 1.28 it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful 
and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So why was he told to replenish the earth? Well, because there were beings there before him. And those angelic beings, the sons of God, who were shouting for joy, were there before him at the creation. <clears throat> but you see, the anti-gaffers will use uh, dictionaries over comparing Scripture with Scripture and say that replenish can also mean just fill, to just fill the thing up and not actually mean to fill up again. Maybe it could, but what about how the Bible uses it? How's God using replenish here in Genesis 1? Let God interpret the terms. So he said for them to replenish in verse 28, right? Well, I want you to notice something. Six verses above Genesis 128. In Genesis 122, it says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. And let fowl multiply on the earth. So God made a distinction. In verse 22, he told the water creatures to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters. Why not replenish? Why did he use different words there? Because it's, it's easy because Adam was replenishing in the sense of refilling. You see, God's plan was to make a universe full of sons of God. The angelic beings, they failed. Now, He's going to use Adam to do it, and he's, Adam's going to replenish. You see, God wanted to have a universe filled with innumerable amounts of sinless creatures. He began his government back there around Genesis 1-1. He gave the sons of God a choice to choose him or go an alternate route. Many chose the alternate route. So he flooded the whole thing out and started over with Adam. And an amazing thing is that Adam is called Son of God. And Luke 3.38, God's plan for the universe started over with him. And it's interesting that he made him a little lower than the angels, right? Possibly to help Adam and people overcome the temptation of getting too high-minded, too big for their britches, you know, above their raising, struck on themselves and all that. Because that's what happened with Lucifer. He was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. The angels created with such great power. So he made Adam a little lower than the angels. Maybe they wouldn't try to exalt themselves above the Most High, but you can see that they do. But Adam and Eve were to start replenishing the earth, which would lead to populating the universe eventually because the earth would get so full, you know, nobody's dying, people would keep having children, so it would it would expand on out into the, the other planets that God made and that was God's original plan uh, just populating the universe with sinless beings but that also ends in failure as we'll eventually see so there's just a lot more stuff I could go into on the gap but I'll just go ahead and stop it there two lessons I think really <clears throat> nailed it nails it home I gave a lot of proof for it. If you still don't believe in it, that's cool too. I don't think that you're not a Bible believer for not believing in it. I don't think it's a big deal, a huge deal if you don't. A lot of gappers believe, man, it's a huge deal if you don't believe in it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think you'll be okay as long as you don't bad mouth and throw false accusations at those who do believe it. Just like I'm not going to bad mouth and throw false accusations at you for not believing it. <clears throat> but that is the gap. That's the first couple scenes there of the Bible. You know, the Bible is like a movie. It's got scenes. So far we've looked at from everlasting, you know, eternity past. Then we looked at in the beginning. And then next, I think I'm going to do a, a big lesson on the spirit world next and show you the the uh, angels, cherubim, and seraphim that God created back there before he laid the foundations of the earth and really explain those to you and you can get that in your Bible and then you'll just, you'll have that down for when you need it.